First, let me begin by thanking you, you for inviting me uh, to the uh, workshop. It's odd, as Serge said, we, you know, he and I, we live in the same country, work in the same place, and by Canadian standards, we're neighbors, we're not that far away, Toronto and Montreal, but we actually met in Istanbul, uh, <laughs> rather than here in Canada. And in fact, there's another colleague of mine at York University, who I met for the first time in Germany somewhere, <laughs> at a conference. <laughs> but at any rate, okay, thank you. So, I've been uh, sort of looking at the neural basis of reasoning and problem solving for almost 20 years now. And what I'd like to do is share some <clears throat> insights with you regarding uh, the, our work on deductive reasoning. And I've organized the talk along the lines of, is there a, a logical reasoning module in the brain, or at least a unitary logical reasoning module in the brain? Okay. So, the, uh, these are sort of the components of the talk. I'll begin by defining what the subject matter of logical reasoning is. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit uh, about modules, what I mean by uh, a module in the brain, um, uh, with, uh, modules with respect to logic. Uh, I will say a few words also about cognitive uh, theories of reasoning. The, the, we've already heard a little bit about them this uh, uh, this morning and this afternoon. I'll just have a very few brief things to say. And then I will say a little bit about the role of cognitive neuroscience, not just in terms of uh, studying uh, logic, but what is the relationship of cognitive neuroscience to uh, cognitive psychology. When I began uh, teaching cognitive psychology, I would use the standard textbooks, and they would have cognitive psychology stuff in them. And then 10, 15 years later, I have the same textbooks, but now they've got the cognitive psychology stuff, and then they've got five, six, seven chapters on neuropsychology. And I look at them, and I can't put the two together. I, mean, I don't know what the students make of them, but even I don't know why the stuff is there often. Uh, so the, it's a real question. I think it's a real issue that needs to be uh, discussed. I'll say a little bit about uh, the research strategy we've been using, and, and provide you at least uh, you know, there, there is a claim, uh, at least by one lab, that there is a reasoning, a, a, a module for deductive reasoning. And I'll show you the data for that. And then I will sort of go through our data, which uh, sort of says, no, there is no module for, uh, for logical reasoning. And we'll look at um, uh, between logical forms, I will look, and then within logical forms. And essentially, w w what the story is, I'm going to show you uh, double dissociations across these different domains. And the standard interpretation of them, of double dissociations, and I'll explain what a double dissociation is as we're going along, is that uh, th they are um, uh, pointing to causally distinct systems. Um, okay? And then I will uh, summarize by um, uh, you know, explicitly stating some implications uh, uh, of this work for logic as a psychological notion, uh, logical theories of reasoning, and neuropsychology or the structure, the organization of the frontal lobes. So, okay. 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 So, in terms of the subject matter of reasoning, reasons I take it are sort of causally necessary, though not sufficient, mediators between goals, beliefs, and actions, at least in normal circumstances. So for example, if you have the following goal, invade Iraq, kill Saddam Hussein, and secure the oil leases, and if, you, you know, if we think we can do it surgically and uh, have support of the Iraqis and the country can repay its own construction costs, uh, you know, then you want to invade Iraq. And if you believe that you have the military and the strategic capabilities to do this, then it's perfectly logical to invade Iraq. Right? And this is what reasoning is all about. Uh, and the psychology of reasoning studies our ability to draw such inferences. Right. Now, there are two types of um, uh, inferences that we, we uh, typically uh, differentiate, deduction and induction. So in the case of deduction, the premises uh, provide sufficient reason for accepting the conclusions. In the case of induction, the premises do not provide sufficient reasons, but they provide some reasons. That's sort of the basic uh, difference. And the question that I'm really asking is, is there some special dedicated machinery in the brain for drawing these inferences? Right? That, that's really the, the, the question at stake here. Um, 
Uh, let me provide some qualifiers here, though. So there's induction and there is deduction. From the work that we've done, essentially the, the picture that's emerging is that there are distinct but overlapping mechanisms for inductive and deductive reasoning. And I think in the case of real world reasoning, the inductive uh, mechanism responds even in the case of deduction. I mean, th this is, I think, the results in some of the fallacies that, that uh, have been discussed and will be discussed during this week. And my gut reaction, it, you know, my gut says this is not probabilistic, the induction. Um, but that's a different story. I mean, I, uh, so I'm not even going to get into that, but um, I'm going to restrict myself to talking about deductive reasoning. Okay. So here's an example of some deductive reasoning. Okay, I say to my son, if you want dinner tonight, then you need to stop tormenting your sister. Now, given he wants dinners and draws the correct conditional inference, order will eventually be restored. Right? This is what we believe in psychology. But those of you that are old enough to have teenage children know this is absolute nonsense. Right? But nonetheless, this is the, uh, 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 this is the way we study logical reasoning. Uh, another argument here that uh, was perva pervasive a few years ago, uh, all the 9-11 perpetrators were Muslims, all the 9-11 perpetrators were terrorists, therefore all Muslims are terrorists. Right? Not a valid argument, but nonetheless an argument that many people drew, and it had real consequences in terms of American elections, in terms of money and uh, politics. Uh, okay? So reasoning matters, and it's important sort of to get it right. Okay. But logic, in some sense, is owned by philosophers. And their main concern is with the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. What is the uh, warrant that the premises provide for accepting the conclusion? However, there is a historical relationship between logic and psychology that goes back at least to Boole and uh, Frege. And in the case of cognitive psychology, I think uh, there is a, uh, a special relationship in that logic provides the underlying explanatory machinery of the whole discipline. Uh, in, on the strong version of the claim, the mind is a formal deductive system. Right? This is the language of thought, the computational theory of mind story. On the weak claim, the, you know, what the weak claim is that is the structure of recursive function theory captures something about the structure of our minds. Like calculus, the structure of calculus captures something about the structure <coughs> of the physical world. Right? So, uh, so I, I think the um, uh, for cognitive psychology, uh, the, um, the issue of logic is an important one. Um, so our ability to engage in logical reasoning needs an explanation in terms of its underlying mechanisms. Okay? And this is what we're interested in uh, in terms of logic as psychologists. Yeah. So let me also say a few words about modules. So the question is, is there some sort of special dedicated machinery, a module in the brain for drawing these inferences, these uh, logical inferences that I've alluded to? So the word module is, is a loaded term. And uh, you know, there's got to be at least 100 papers in the literature on what a module is. And the, the whole literature starts with Jerry Fodor his famous uh, book um, uh, on modularity. And in it, Fodor defined a module in terms of information encapsulation. And in short, essentially what he does, he makes a distinction between, in, in computational terms, this is what information encapsulation is. He makes a distinction between local and global variables and argues that modules pass information through local variables only. Okay? And that they are specialized, dedicated local processing mechanisms immune to world knowledge. Now, a more general way of perhaps understanding what Fodor is saying in terms of information encapsulation is by just looking at your cell phone and looking at the different apps. So you may have an app called Google Maps uh, that I've got and everyone else has. And then you may have, a, I've got an app called Sports Tracker that I use when I'm walking, it tells me how far I've walked and sort of draws a map. Now the interesting thing is both of these apps call upon the, um, the GPS unit in the, in the phone. Now I can turn on my uh, Google Maps, it'll call upon the GPS, it'll download the, area, the map area where I'm in, and it'll tell me where I am. Good, so now it's got that. However, then when I turn on my sports tracker, it cannot get the information from Google Maps. It has to, down, it has to access the, uh, 
the GPS unit and download the maps and so forth and go through the whole procedure. So this is information encapsulation is what it means. Okay. For our purposes, what, I'm, uh, what I mean by modules is an innate, dedicated, unitary mechanism specific to reasoning. Minimally, what you uh, want to uh, commit yourself to if you're talking about modules is that uh, there is something more to reasoning than general purpose memory, working memory, attention, executive functions, and so forth. Right? Now, this is actually a minority view. I take it most of the psychologists in the room share this view. This is why you study reasoning. But I think majority of the psychologists do not. And this is why reasoning is not recognized as a legitimate topic in most psychology departments. Uh, whereas working memory, language, and uh, so forth, uh, attention are. Okay. So if you sort of accept this view that there is something more to uh, uh, our ability to reason than simply calling upon working memory, attention, and uh, um, uh, so-called executive functions, it has some implications. Okay. It suggests that this module is used whenever we reason. Whether we're reasoning about bananas, money, blue cheese, or abstract placeholders. So whether uh, the argument is something like uh, uh, all apples are fruits, all fruits are sweet, all apples are sweet, or all A's are B's, all B's are C's, all A's are C's, the same mechanism would be engaged. Right. This is what, uh. Furthermore, if you, it also follows on here that uh, if you can draw the first if you can draw this inference here, then you must also be able to draw this inference here, okay, and vice versa. Otherwise, you can't really reason. This is one of the criteria for reasoning. Uh, also, the notions of abstractness, generalizability, and systematicity are key markers to determine if an organism can indeed reason. And this actually comes out in a very interesting way when we look at the data on uh, animals reasoning or s s small preverbal children uh, uh, reasoning. Mm -hmm. It also suggests that this module is used irrespective of the logical relationships involved. So whether you're engaged in a, a conjunction, disjunction, transitivity, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. The same sort of this logical uh, uh, module should be engaged, this, uh, this body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. All right. So why do we believe, or, or why do many people have the intuition that there is some sort of logical module, there's some sort of dedicated piece of machinery involved in uh, logical reasoning. Well, I think one of the strongest reasons is the content independence of deduction. Right? You don't need any world knowledge, and this is where modules shines. This is, uh, this is what modules do. So for example, you know, if I uh, say to you, ask you, you know, Tweety's a robin, no robins are migrants, and I ask you, is Tweety a migrant or not? Uh, and you, you know, or uh, Jenkins is a bachelor, no bachelors are married, uh, is Jenkins married or not? In each case, you tell me that Tweety's not a migrant or Jenkins is not married, but I say to you then, do you know Tweety the Robin or Jenkins the bachelor? And you don't, but of course that's the whole point of deduction, right? The, it doesn't matter the, what the, uh, the placeholder's the content is, are, you know these arguments are valid because they have this form, and any argument with that form is going to be valid. Right? So if there's going to be a module for anything in the brain, you would think there'd be a module for logical reasoning. I certainly did right, when we began this, uh, this enterprise. Right? Also, this, um, this logic module, I think, is also necessary for the lot story, the language of thought story. The, um, uh, you know, on this account, essentially, a system with, uh, we need a system with a combinatorial syntax and semantics and structure sensitivity to process. And if we have such a system, it can explain truth preservation and the puzzle of mental causation uh, within a symbolic system. This is Jerry Fodor's whole argument uh, for what the language of thought gives us. And on such a system, the logic is built into the structure of the explanatory machinery. It's not an add-on. This is how the machine works. It's built in, in a, a particular way. And this is why Fodor and uh, Plish and so forth have been so insistent that connectionist networks can't do that because they're not built in that way. They can sort of mimic it, but they're not uh, language of thought machineries. So if you buy the language of thought story, then you, you, you've got to sort of um, uh, uh, deal with the, 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 the logical brain uh, in some ways. Okay.
So let me also say a few words about where psychological theories of uh, reasoning stand on the modularity uh, question. So there are three main theories, mental logic, mental models, uh, dual mechanism theory. And David, I know I should say the probability theory, but I, I'm sorry, I, I haven't included it in here. <laughs> It's a personal bias. I, I, we can talk about this. I, I can't get over it. Uh, some hang-ups I have about probability. Uh, anyways. Hmm? <laughs> All right. So I think each of these theories assumes that there is something more to logic than just problem solving uh, and executive functions type of thing. Uh, so there is some sort of commitment to the psychological reality of logical constructs, uh, if not a single module. Now they disagree on what the mechanisms might be, but whatever the mechanisms uh, is or are, uh, they're used in all cases of logical reasoning, irrespective of content or logical form. I think the, uh, uh, the theories would have to sort of uh, agree on that. Um, uh, and just in brief, um, um, in terms of mental logic theory and uh, mental models theory. The way I uh, describe the two is as follows. I differentiate between them on, based on competence knowledge, mechanisms, and representations. So for mental logic theory, the competence knowledge consists of the inferential role of the closed formal logical terms of the language. The mechanism is one of inference, and the representation preserves the structural properties of the linguistic strings in which the premises are stated. For mental models theory, the competence knowledge consists of the meaning of the closed form or logical terms of the language. The mechanism is one of search, and perhaps the biggest difference is, is that the representations preserve the structural properties of the world that the premises are about, rather than the structural properties of the premises themselves. Okay. And in terms of dual mechanism uh, theory or hypotheses, the basic idea is that there's a distinction to be made between schooled explicit reasoning and intuitive implicit reasoning processes. Uh -huh. So reasoning about familiar situations automatically utilizes situation-specific heuristics, and where no such heuristics are available, as in reasoning about unfamiliar situations, uh, then universal or formal methods are used to solve the problem. Now, there are a... Um, I mean, it's not a unified account as, uh, as a mental model, like mental models or uh, mental logic. There's sort of a whole array of theories. Uh, Evans, uh, uh, Sloman have different accounts, Stanovich and West. Um, even I think Newland Simons, uh, the heuristic and formal systems can be mapped onto sort of this account. And different researchers, researchers have differential, differentially emphasized explicit and implicit processes, uh, conscious, pre-conscious processes, formal and heuristic processes, associative and rule-based processes. And I'm sure there's some overlap uh, among these, but I, uh, I also think they're quite distinct uh, sort of processes that are being pointed to. And in some sense, I mean, it's not a theory of reasoning, but maybe a way of saying sometimes we reason, that is, do deduction, and when we do that, maybe we use mental models or mental logic, but other, other times we don't, you know, we do something else. Uh, maybe something along the lines of induction or something. Um, uh, okay. So, so I'm just sort of laying out the sort of the, the groundwork here. So we've talked about uh, the subject matter, uh, deductive reasoning. We've talked about uh, what I mean by you know a module. We've talked about um, psychological theories of reasoning, and. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, sort of cognitive neuroscience because uh, you know you had these wonderful uh, discussions, uh, presentations uh, during the day, but there was no mention of neuroscience. Right? There were really nice experimental results, and uh, and for you know 50 years this field has uh, uh, progressed and uh, maybe flourished uh, without uh, uh, worrying too much about uh, neuroscience. And so I think it's a legitimate question. Can uh, neuroscience contribute something to the field? And uh, by this, in terms of by, uh, in terms of informing our cognitive theories of reasoning, okay. and I, I, th I think it can, though it's not obvious what that contribution uh, is. And I think often the, the data is misused uh, 
So I think the, uh, sort of the, there are three, at least three positions you can take with respect to neuropsychological data. Uh, and uh, that is with respect to neuropsychological data and psychological theories. Right? One is the further position, leave the brain alone. Uh, second is a reductionist position, and the third is what I call the proper role of cognitive neuroscience, right? and I'm going to discuss each one with you. Now, leave the brain alone. Now, this was the position. This, Jerry Fodor actually provides this argument that I have on the slide. But it was a position that was accepted by everyone up until maybe 98, maybe 2000. I remember the first imaging study that we did on logical reasoning, 95, 94, 95. I submitted it to the cognitive sciences, uh, not the journal, the uh, conference. And they sent it back. It said nothing to do with us. Uh, uh, they didn't accept it. Uh, so. But since then, the field has moved. And now the problem is, if it's an imaging study, it must be important, so it should be published, right? Uh, so it's worth thinking about what really, um, uh, you know, what the data is showing and providing and how it, is, uh, how it should be used. All right. So the Fodor argument, I think it's a really sort of neat argument. I'm a big fan of Jerry Fodor. Uh, it goes along the, as follows. So, Cognitive theories need to satisfy at least two necessary constraints. First, they need an intentional semantic vocabulary, and second, it need to be physicalist. This has to be physical theory. Right? Neuroscience can give us the second, but not the first. Right? Uh, because if you open up a, a neuroscience textbook, when I uh, you know, do my neuroscience class, and I'm talking about uh, uh, neurons, and uh, you're talking about ion channels and potassium pumps, Nothing to do with beliefs and desires, nothing to do with the thing's information, right? Um, but as Fodor points out, computation can give us both. Now, he says both, but it's really sort of both. Okay, there's a bit of uh, uh, smoke and mirrors here, but uh, you know, let's just say sort of both. First of all, you get an intentional vocabulary, intentional semantic vocabulary for free, and you get a guarantee via the church Turing hypothesis of physical realizability of the postulated process and mechanism. And beyond this, we don't have to worry about the physical. We're done. As psychologists, we're done. And there'll be other people that will worry about how the system is actually built. Right? So if you accept this argument, and it's not a bad argument. This, um, in fact, uh, I was a, uh, my first year grad student. I was a student at Herbert Simon. He, he told me himself, all you had to do was write the program. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to take a, do a biology class, right? I mean, this is... So this was a, it's a very pervasive attitude. It may seem a little quaint now and outdated, but uh, certainly when I was in graduate school, uh, this was the standard position. Right. And from this, Fodor concludes that the merit of neuroimaging studies purporting to identify the location of various functions are not very useful. Location gives us no insight into causation. And he's right, right? as far as it goes. All right. Now, the second position one can take is one of reductionism. And this is a quote from uh, Glimcher and Rustini from the journal Science in 2004. Not 1924, but 2004. All right? Let me read it to you. The full understanding of utility they're talking about, uh, decision theory, will come from biology and psychology by the reduction to the elements of human behavior, followed by a bottom-up synthesis, not from the social science by top-down inference and guesswork based on intuitive knowledge. Okay. And this is a very, very common view shared by many serious scientists, uh, certainly many serious neuroscientists. And, but this is, it's gotta be, you know, in 1924, you know, you could give reasons that maybe this could be true, but now we know this is a crazy idea, right? And why do you know it's a crazy idea? Because it assumes that the concepts at the lower level will linearly scale up to the higher level concepts, right? And uh, the best example I know uh, to show, you know, to show the uh, ludicrous this assumption is, is one given by Polini in his Nobel uh, lectures. Uh, he wrote a little book called Heuristics that I read as a grad student. And I still remember this example from 30 years ago. And he gave the following example. He said, look, one could know all of the laws of physics, yet never predict the existence of a typewriter. And that's absolutely true. Someone has to invent the typewriter. Someone has to invent the iPad or the, uh, or the iPhone. It's not enough to just to know the laws of physics, right? 
So the laws of physics will constrain what can exist, but they will not allow you to predict what will exist. Just like the laws at the, at the lower level, uh, neuroscience, uh, you know, at, at the level of the brain, will constrain what our higher level concepts can exist, but they will never allow you to predict what those concepts are. And the only way you can predict them is by guessing, doing exactly what they say not to do, you know, use your intuition, you guess, and then you've got to go back and make sure they're consistent with the lower level uh, uh, laws and concepts, right? If they're not, you've got to throw them away and start again. Uh, but that's really the only way um, uh, sort of you can get at this. So reductionism, uh, I don't think it has a lot to recommend itself. Uh, um, no. At least not now. All right. So what is the proper role for um, uh, cognitive neuroscience? Well, there's a couple of um, pieces of information I think we can get from cognitive neuroscience. Uh, one is lo uh, localization, and the uh, second is dissociations. So first, let's talk about uh, localizations. Okay. So modern neuropsychology is based on the assumption, sort of we accept that when it comes to the brain, Gall was largely correct and Lashley was largely incorrect about how the brain is organized. And just to remind you, what Gall said was uh, moral and intellectual faculties are innate. They're located in the brain. They're organized into organs or modules. There are many uh, particular organs as there are propensities, sentiments, and faculties which differ essentially from each other. And that the form of the head or cranium represents the form of the brain and thus reflects the relative development of the brain. And what Lashley said was he, he had the mass action uh, uh, theory, right? The cortex as, acts as a whole. And if one part is damaged, another part sort of takes over. And so, as I say, modern uh, cognitive neuroscience is really based upon Gall. And we only disagree on one point. The only thing that Gall essentially got wrong was the last point, that the form of the head or the cranium represents the form of the brain. So now we know you've got to look inside the skull because the skull doesn't fit tightly over the brain. So if you want to find those bumps and those larger areas, you've got to look inside. This is why you've got to use an MRI or something or do not. Otherwise, essentially, we're doing what Gall was doing. Right? So on the localization account, essentially, so we accept that there's a degree of modularity in brain organization. And we have some gross knowledge of locations. And we can use this knowledge to understand uh, mechanisms of reasoning. So for example, if you're arguing about visual spatial systems versus uh, linguistic systems, you might do an imaging study and you might see whether you, your task activates a linguistic system or a visual spatial system. Okay? But uh, uh, so this is uh, really all you can get from, um, uh, from the localization. And as the photo says, localization gives you no um, a handle on uh, causation. It doesn't, uh, you know, in terms of the um, uh, theoretical framework. Okay, so what is, uh, so if localization is limited, w uh, what are the other options? Well, the other options are to search for dissociations. And uh, so dissociations are selective impairments. You can have a single dissociation or a double dissociation. A single dissociation is a case where you have a lesion in region X and it results in a deficit of function A, but not function B. And a double dissociation is if we find another case in which a lesion in region Y results in a deficit in function B, but not in function A. Um, so the, uh, the most famous example of dissociations uh, is usually language. Right? So in 1860, I think it was 1860, 60s, let's say, I, uh, Broca, uh, the French neurologist, uh, presented a patient uh, who had a lesion in what we now call Broca's area, so la left lateral uh, uh, ventral prefrontal cortex. And this patient, as a, presumably as a consequence of the lesion, was able to um, understand language, but she could not utter generate language. Right? So this is an example of a, um, a single dissociation. About 10, 12 years later in the 1870s, Wernicke, presented, I believe, two patients who had lesions in what we now call Wernicke's area, um, sort of medial uh, temporal lobe, BA 21, 22 uh, region. And these individuals could um, generate language, but they could not comprehend language. 
So e individually, we have a single dissociation. And the, the, the inferences we can draw from it are limited. However, with the two cases together, we get a double dissociation. And, the, um, uh, and this really is the gold standard in neuropsychology. So the idea is double dissociations tell us something about the, cog the, uh, the causal joints in the cognitive system. Right? And they provide causal constraints on the individuation of functions. So again, going back to language, if you are a cognitive psychologist developing a theory of language, and the data on the dissociation that you have is good, I mean, maybe, the, 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 maybe they were mistaken, right? The data can always be bad. But assuming that the data is good, and you accept the double dissociations, what it means is that your theory of language needs to have two different systems, a, system, a separate system for generating language and a separate system for comprehending language right? to be uh, consistent with uh, how our, our own uh, linguistic system is organized. Uh, okay? so, the, um, uh, so our research strategy has been uh, to use the cognitive neuroscience methodology, uh, particularly double dissociations, um, on, uh, on, on reasoning tasks. Right? This, this is what we, we've been doing. And another way to think of a double dissociation in more psychological terms is as a crossover interaction. Right? This is the, uh, and in, when we talk about double dissociation in imaging studies, this is really also uh, what we're talking about. Uh, okay. So, as I said, there is, I think, uh, value in neuropsychology data. For psychologists, but one has to use it, uh, uh, you know, in a sensible way. Okay. So we began our research program by testing the implicit neural predictions made by the three cognitive theories of reasoning. And in fact, I genuinely thought I was going to find a logic module. All right. uh, so in terms of the the predictions by the three theories, mental logic theory essentially it's a linguistic hypothesis. So it needs to predict that the neuroanatomical mechanisms of language, particularly syntax, I would think, uh, syntactic processing, underwrite human reasoning processes. Right? Mental models theory uh, is a visual spatial account, and it needs to predict that the neural structures of visual spatial processing contribute the basic representational building blocks used for logical reasoning. Right? So both mental models theory and mental logic theory are making a localization prediction. Dual mechanism theory, on the other hand, needs to predict the involvement of two different brain systems in human reasoning. Okay. Now, it's difficult to make a prediction about what these systems are because they're not really specified by the theory, but nonetheless, there's two systems, you know, system A, system B, heuristic system, analytical system, uh, whatever you want to call them. Okay. And this is actually an interesting prediction and one you can test uh, with uh, neuropsychological data. Now, so our strategy, um, uh, say we um, uh, sort of began looking for a, a reasoning module, but we soon realized that there was much more uh, going on uh, in, in our data uh, than you know, what my logical intuitions predicted, and much more than was anticipated by the logical theories. Okay? And so the program turned into a sort of a general search for dissociations in the functional anatomy of reasoning. And we've pursued it in two ways. One is with fMRI and also with structural MRI now. And here what we're looking at is activation of differential uh, neural networks uh, in imaging studies in response to cognitive tasks designed to engage different reasoning systems. Right? And this is usually done in normal healthy controls. And it provides this evidence of the sufficiency of a particular area for the task. With patient studies, what we're looking at is we're looking for selective reasoning impairments in pathological brains. And this provides us uh, evidence for the necessity of a particular area um, uh, for that task. Yeah. Now, in terms of what we've found, um, I've already said that we've not found a um, uh, unitary reasoning module in the brain, be it mental logic or mental uh, models. Uh, what there is is evidence for a fractionated system that is dynamically configured in response to certain uh, tasks and environmental cues. But there are more than two paths or systems, uh, contra to dual mechanism theory. So there is some support for uh, some sort of multiple reasoning systems hypothesis. And we've investigated five types of tasks, uh, environmental cues, that result in uh, 
reconfiguration of the reasoning system. Uh, familiarity, conflict, determinacy, uh, logical form, and emotions. I'm not going to say anything about emotions at all. That's a separate talk uh, in itself. Uh, okay. But before I get into that, let me show you the, there is, as I say, one lab that uh, believes that there is a, a logical reasoning module. And th these are two papers uh, from the uh, Oshersen uh, uh, lab. So in 2001, they published a paper uh, showing, uh, identifying the right uh, inferior frontal um, uh, lobe. Sorry, that's the temporal there. Uh, here, it's not actually inferior, but right um, uh, frontal lobe and middle temporal lobe for uh, deductive reasoning and the left for probabilistic reasoning. Then in 2009, they published another paper in which they identified the reasoning module as left BA10, this region right here. And uh, the other one is six, this region here. So more dorsal uh, um, um, uh, left uh, pre uh, prefrontal cortex. Now, and from this, what they argue is that uh, reasoning, you know, th 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 this is sort of, the, sort of the locus of reasoning and it's separate from linguistic processing, visual spatial probabilis processing, probabilistic reasoning, and so forth. This is an uh, area of the brain that is actually dedicated for logical reasoning. Okay. And as I said, we've not found any evidence for this whatsoever, and I'm going to show you now the, the data that w w we've generated. And I can also, uh, when we come to the point, I'll show you why um, we haven't found these results. There's, uh, there's, at least in the first experiment, there is a uh, significant count found that uh, we can reproduce those results if we have the count found in the study. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to, in terms of dissociations, I'm going to talk about dissociations between logical forms and then within logical forms. Right? So as we were doing our uh, reasoning studies, one of the things we noticed is that uh, we would get different patterns of brain activation depending on whether we were using syllogisms uh, or we were using uh, uh, transitive inference items. Right? And it was not only us the whole literature seemed to be uh, sort of in disarray because no one was getting uh, sort of consistent results throughout. Okay. So uh, I wrote a, a review back in 2007, a qualitative, so I did a sort of a, a qualitative summary of the results and suggested one of the reasons that we were not getting uh, uh, sort of consistent results was that there were different systems involved in different logical forms. And within the logical forms, there were important differences. And then in uh, 2011, uh, Prado et al. did a very nice meta-analysis, which quantitatively showed uh, uh, this. And so he identified different systems in relational arguments, categorical arguments, and propositional arguments. Okay. So arguing that different brain areas are activated in relational, categorical, and propositional arguments. Okay. Now this is sort of nice, but the real question is, can we show, to sh argue that they're two separate systems, we need to show a, a, a double dissociation or, uh, between them. Okay. So recently we did a, um, um, a, a patient study, a large patient study involving 62 patients with focal lesions to the uh, various areas of the brain. And you can see, this is the distribution of the lesions for the uh, 62 patients. And also, incidentally, this is the region identified in uh, Montelli et al. for the deduction area, the 2009 paper, and this is the region identified in the uh, 2000, uh, 2001 paper, the Parsons and Osherson. And those patients have no difficulty with reasoning uh, uh, problems whatsoever. Okay, but what I want to, what we did here is we, um, uh, one of the things we were interested in is the different logical forms. So categorical syllogisms versus transitive inference items. Okay. Is there a difference between the, um, uh, the brain areas involved in uh, uh, dealing with these um, uh, uh, argument forms? Or more particularly, is it possible to find patients, selected patients, who have selective deficits that can do one but not the other, and vice versa. And this is what I'm going to uh, show you. Okay. 
So we used a voxel-based uh, morphometry technique. And in this technique, so this is patients with uh, um, uh, lesions, and these are all um, uh, open head, uh, these, these are not co um, closed head injury, but they're open uh, head injury uh, patients. They're in fact all Vietnam War veterans, so they were all shot. Uh, so these, these are actually very good patients uh, for, for this type of study. So every patient undergoes a CT scan in this case. Every brain scan is registered to a template. Images are smoothed to each voxel and they represent the average of itself and its neighbors. All image volumes are compared at every voxel. And the behavioral scores of all patients who have a lesion at a specific voxel are compared with the t-test to the scores of all patients uh, or normal controls who do not have a lesion in that voxel. And the results are corrected for multiple comparisons. And when we do this, what we're essentially finding is that patients with lesions in the right uh, anterior uh, polar region, in this region here, uh, have difficulty um, in performing syllogisms, but they are um, perfectly fine in the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the transitive, and, uh, and vice versa. These, the patients with the uh, right parietal lesions have difficulty with um, uh, the transitive items, but they're perfectly fine with the, um, with the syllogisms. And you can sort of see the, um, uh, the, the crossover uh, uh, significant interaction there. And these patients are sort of, uh, the, the, the studies control for both IQ, working memory, and so forth uh, on these patients. Also, if we do uh, VBM with healthy adolescents, uh, this is with the um, uh, population, about 130 adolescents that we scanned in uh, uh, Tenerife, uh, Spain. What we find is that with um, uh, the, um, uh, we, we can fi find significant results uh, of correlation of gray matter density uh, in, um, in the parietal lobes with transitive inference, but not with uh, categorical reasoning. So this is replicating half of the previous result. We haven't been able to do the, uh, the other half using this uh, method here. Okay, so just to summarize this. Okay. So what these results are showing is a sort of a, a crossover interaction or double dissociation between transitive inference and parietal lobe lesions and categorical syllogisms in frontal lobe lesions. So lesions to the right frontal lobe and parietal uh, lobe differentially affect performance in transitive and uh, syllogistic reasoning. And so this is consistent with a separate mechanism uh, module account. Now, I don't want to overstate the case, but uh, there, this is at least providing some interesting evidence uh, for the system breaking down in a way that's specific to logical form. Uh, in this case, sort of set inclusion versus uh, linear relations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I want to move to dissociations internal to logical form. So these are all uh, transitive arguments, and you don't have to read any of them, except look at the color change. So there's nine arguments there. Um, okay, so here, they're divided up in three different ways. So here we have a division between arguments that have believable contents, London is north of Paris, versus City A is north of City B. You have no beliefs about City A and City B. So that's one uh, distinction. Now the distinction is wherever you have believable uh, information uh, in the premises and uh, conclusion, you're going to have a situation where either the premises can be consistent. I'm sorry, the conclusion can either be consistent with the um, uh, with the logic, or it can be inconsistent with the logic. So you can have a a valid argument with a true conclusion. Uh, an invalid argument with a false conclusion. That's those are both consistent. Or you can have a valid argument with an incon a uh, false conclusion um, and a uh, invalid argument with a true conclusion. Those are both inconsistent. So this is this uh, division that I'm showing you here. And the third division is between determinate and indeterminate arguments. So if an argument is valid, it is determinate. But uh, it can be invalid for two reasons. It, it's invalid because it's inconsistent or it's indeterminate. And if it's inconsistent, then again, it's, it falls under determinacy. But indeterminate arguments, although are invalid, they're invalid for a different reason. And uh, we were surprised to find out that the brain treats them in totally different ways. 
Um, okay, so this is what I'm going to show you now, these three distinctions. So the first in terms of heuristic and formal systems, where you've got the believable content versus no content. Okay. So, you know, content effects on reasoning um, are, of course, well known. The first paper on them was back in 1928, I believe, by uh, Mary Wilkins. And the basic idea is, is that um, if, you know, this is, this, these arguments are from a, um, a well-known paper by Evans uh, et al. Uh, from back in 83. So here you have an argument, no cigarettes are inexpensive, some addictive things are inexpensive, therefore some addictive things are not cigarettes. Okay. Now this argument is valid and the conclusion is true and it's accept, accepted 92% of the time. The following argument, which is identical, no addictive things are inexpensive, some cigarettes are inexpensive, therefore some cigarettes are not addictive, is um, equally valid, it's, it's, it's same exact same logical argument, but the conclusion is false, and it, the, the acceptance rates drops to 46%. Right? A very robust finding, and the acceptance rates of this argument and sort of the, the formal version of these arguments would be somewhere between those two. Um, Extremes. So we did some initial studies using content and no content uh, uh, material. And what we found is that uh, you know, there is a content reasoning pathway and a no content reasoning pathways. So arguments like all dogs are pets actually activated a left frontal temporal system. Arguments like all A's are B's, even though identical argument, activates a occipital, bilateral occipital, parietal, and then dorsal frontal uh, system. Now you might think, well, maybe that's just to do with the fact that um, uh, you have content in one and no content in the other. It may have nothing to do with reasoning if you're just doing a simple subtraction. But if you do an interaction analysis, which uh, controls for the presence or absence of content, you get the same results and do I, uh, oh, patient data. I've actually, the, you'll have to take my word for it. Uh, the, uh, you do get the uh, similar results in the interaction analysis. The, 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 this is actually just a subtraction. I should have another slide in here which shows you the interaction, which uh, the, 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 the activations are a little smaller, but they're still um, significant and in the right locations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what the imaging data then shows is a frontal temporal system engaged during reasoning with familiar material and a parietal less frontal system engaged during uh, reasoning with unfamiliar material. And this is actually, uh, uh, in so far as it goes, is consistent with the dual mechanism account. Okay. But if this is actually true, then one would expect frontal lobe patients should be more impaired on reasoning about familiar situations than on, familiar, on uh, unfamiliar situations. So you should be able to see it in the patient data if it's real. Okay. So here's a couple of patient studies showing you exactly that. So this is a study involving frontal temporal dementia patients. And here in red here, you can see the extent of the, uh, the progression of the disease. What's important to note here is that the temporal lobes and the frontal lobes are affected, uh, both bilaterally, but the parietal lobes are spared on these patients. Right? And we gave them tasks like the teachers in front of the blackboard versus Austria's east of Switzerland. The teacher in front of the blackboard, you don't really have any beliefs about because you don't know which teacher we're, we're, we're talking about. But Austria is east of Switzerland, uh, you, you, know, you could agree or disagree with that. Uh, and what we find is that these patients in the unfamiliar, unfamiliar condition, they do perfectly fine. They're doing about 75%. Uh, but, uh, so there, you know, this is the, the, the controls and the patients. Um, but in the familiar conditions, the patients are down to chance level. Okay. Uh, on the, again, the, the, the tasks are matched for lo logical form. Okay. Suggesting that uh, the, um, um, you know, it's consistent with the imaging data, uh, the importance of the frontal lobe in dealing with the, uh, the content information. We can also show this with the Wisconsin card sorting task. So this is the task where you've got four cards laid out uh, on a table. Um, in, the, in sort of the formal version, you've got uh, two letters uh, facing you and two numbers facing you. And you've got some sort of rule. If a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other side. 
And this, of course, corresponds to the, um, the conditionals, probably the most famous uh, reasoning task in the literature. Um, and when this task is given to uh, sort of normal, healthy individuals in controlled situations, they will do probably 20% accuracy rates, 25% accuracy rates. When I give it to my undergraduate students in a sort of a classroom situation, two, 3% accuracy rates. Uh, but in a controlled situation, you get about 20, 30% accuracy rates on this task. Okay? And we used a version of the task that was uh, provided by Chen and Holyoke in, uh, back in 1985. It actually had three conditions. The arbitrary rule condition, which I just explained to you, an abstract permission condition, which really is not relevant for us, and the concrete permission uh, condition. That is the famous one, if a person is to drink alcohol, he or she must be at least 21 years of age. Okay? Uh, exactly same task. So when we do it in the, uh, the no content condition, the formal condition, what we find is that um, um, in the arbitrary rule condition, the patients and the controls are performing exactly the same, about 25 to 30 percent, yeah? and that's normal. In the concrete condition, the controls benefit from the presence of the content and jump up to uh, almost 100 percent, 95 to 100 percent. The patients do not jump. The frontal lobe patients with the lesions to the frontal lobes do not jump up. Uh, that they, they uh, improve a, a little bit, but uh, nothing like uh, the front, uh, normal controls. However, what the imaging data said, it was not just frontal lobe patients, it was frontal lobe left uh, prefrontal lesions. And so when we divide these patients up into left and right prefrontal lesions, what you find is that uh, in the concrete permission condition, the, it is the left, patients with the left lesions that uh, cannot do the task at all. They're at like, ten, you know, I think one, of the, one patient was able to do this task. The right are not so bad. They, they are, uh, you know, they're almost as doing as well as the, uh, the normal controls. And again, this is consistent with the, uh, uh, with the imaging data. Okay. So just to sort of summarize this little bit here is uh, contrary to sort of mental models theory and mental logic theory, but consistent with some form of dual mechanism theory, we're finding evidence for engagement of both systems. The distinction we're finding, um, uh, I, I don't think, is what uh, dual mechanism theory anticipated. So parietal activation is reported for unfamiliar situations. Um, this would be the formal reasoning mechanism. Uh, and uh, the frontal temporal system is recruited by the presence of familiar or meaningful content. Uh, and its response tends to be situation specific. And I haven't shown you the data for that, but we can see this in terms of uh, uh, different areas of the, uh, the, the temporal lobe being activated. So if it's a spatial task, we'll get parapocampal gyrus. If it's a task about uh, objects and things, we won't get parapocampal, we'll get medial temporal. So it, it does move around depending on the, the nature of the content. Okay, so the second thing, second sort of uh, uh, dissociation here, just uh, shown maybe is uh, in terms of conflict detection systems. So whenever we're reasoning, you have syllogisms that involve uh, real world knowledge, like some vegetables are not carrots or no strawberries are carrots. You're gonna have situations whereby um, you, know, you can have uh, congruent arguments, incongruent arguments. And again, congruent arguments are where the logical response and the believability of the conclusions uh, coincide. Incongruent arguments are where they diverge, okay? And one of the things that happens, uh, what we find is a um, uh, activation in the right lateral prefrontal cortex corresponding to this detection of this conflict uh, situation. Now this is not, uh, this response is not specific to detecting a, a conflict between logic and uh, uh, content. It's, a, it's just a general purpose uh, inconsistency detection mechanism. And you can see how it sort of responds. You know, we can do studies with one unbelievable conclusion, two unbelievable conclusions, three unbelievable conclusions, and you can sort of see how this area of the brain sort of responds parametrically to the level of uh, um, uh, incongruity involved in the uh, argument. 
Now, whenever you sort of have um, uh, congruent and incongruent arguments, that is, arguments involving real world content, with the um, congruent arguments, people will do very well, but it's very difficult to determine uh, why they've done well. They could have gotten the logical route or they could have gone the belief bias route. However, if they get the argument in, um, um, incorrect, so if, the, if, if they get an incongruent uh, argument incorrect versus they get it correct, if we divide up the incongruent arguments into correct responses and incorrect responses, what we find is a very uh, nice and interesting effect. The, uh, the, correct, the incorrect responses, it's a medial ventral sort of system. Uh, it goes down that route, but when they get it correct, you get engagement of the left prefrontal cortex and the parietal system, which again, consists with engaging of the formal uh, uh, reasoning system. And so that, that, this is a nice result also. And the last disassociation I'm gonna talk about is between determinate and indeterminate inference systems. So look at these argu simple arguments here. A is greater than B, B is greater than C, A is greater than C. So it's a val determined valid argument. The next one here is inconsistent. A is greater than B, B is greater than C, C is greater than A. It's inconsistent with the premises. But the third one, A is greater than B, A is greater than C, B is greater than C. It's not inconsistent with the premises. It could be the case, but it's not definitely the case, it is in, uh, invalid. Now, we found this result almost by accident. The, uh, uh, and it's one of our nicest results that, that we have with the patient data. And the reason I say this is, when we would look at the imaging data, uh, you know, sometimes you'd compare valid and invalid or correct and incorrect responses, and you'd get this right uh, uh, frontal activation. But there was no reason to expect it. None of the theories sort of said it should be there. Uh, anything different should be happening. And it was not significant, you know, corrected for uh, multiple comparisons. So technically, you don't have to report it. In fact, you can't report it, right? No one's going to believe you. So we ignored it for years. And then I collected this patient data. And I looked at the patient data. And uh, I did this sort of standard analysis. And I thought, boy, these guys are really good. There was no difference between their reasoning abilities and the reasoning abilities of the patients, uh, of the normal controls. And then I remembered this uh, finding from the imaging uh, literature, and then so I, I divided up the arguments into determinate, indeterminate, and inconsistent. And we found this very nice uh, uh, double dissociation here. So essentially what the story is, if you were arguments like, you know, Mary is taller than Natasha, the uh, this is the performance, this is the valid arguments, in consistent arguments, in determinate arguments, and this is the performance of the normal controls. Okay. The performance of the uh, patients with the left hemisphere lesions is here. They are just worse at uh, uh, reasoning overall, and this is what you would expect. However, with the patients with the lesions to the right prefrontal cortex, here they're doing 80%, perfectly fine, there's no difference between them and the normal controls. However, just in the indeterminate trials, they're at chance level, right? Why would, I mean, no theory, none of the cognitive theories predict this, right? And this is data that needs to be sort of accounted for. Uh, and so what, again, this is showing, you, I think, is the brain is dealing with uh, uh, this logic, you know, the indeterminate forms in a very different way than the determinate forms. And then we went back and verified it with an imaging study, and sure enough, uh, we can get activation in the left or the right uh, prefrontal cortex depending on the presence or absence of indeterminacy. Now, also, I showed you the, uh, um, the results from Osherson and Parsons and Osherson earlier on. And they identified the, left, the right prefrontal cortex as the locus for deductive reasoning and the left for, um, uh, for probabilistic reasoning. Now, and they specifically set out to do a better job of this than we had done because we had used different logical forms for induction and deduction. They were, they were doing induction and deduction. And they reasoned, well, if we use the same logical form, then that's a better study, right? A better control. And we'd thought of this, but the only way you can use the same logical form is that for your deductive items, they have to be indeterminate. Otherwise, the, uh, the um, 
uh, the whole thing doesn't work. And so this is what they did. And, uh, and this, I mean, our results show that it's the indeterminacy that's driving that effect, not the fact that it's the deduction or probabilistic reasoning. All right. Okay, so let me just summarize that. Okay, so in terminological forms, there's evidence for multiple systems that can be selectively impaired. Uh, content, no content system, uh, within content, congruent, incongruent trials, and then within valid, indeterminate, and consistent forms. And suggest there is not a unitary system or module that uh, resolves logical forms varying along these uh, dimensions. Okay. Now, uh, I should end in a few minutes here. So I'm going to, I was going to say a few words about sort of putting the system back together again, but let me, I can easily go past those and just do a couple of summary slides. So. Okay, so in, so I've got three, four slides here just sort of summarizing, uh, I think, what the, sort of the main points are. The first point is that cognitive neuroscience can give us information about localization dissociations uh, and maybe interconnections, though I'm very skeptical about this. Um, and so it's an important additional tool to have in your toolbox but it must be used sensibly in the context of 100 years of neuropsychology research. There's enormous amounts that we've actually, uh, neuropsychologists have actually discovered over the past 100, 150 years. Um, so, and it's also critical to use complementary methods. The, uh, for example, the complementary methods we use are fMRI in patients, and what we're looking for is convergence using those two different methodologies on the same uh, dissociation or the same results. Uh, cognitive neuroscience data can address, I think, certain specific questions relevant to uh, theories of reasoning or any psychological theory. Um, but it's not a sort of a panacea for uh, all that ails us. And, and the warning that I give people here is that the brain is organized in surprising ways. It will force reconceptualization of your most cherished ideas. It's not for the timid or faint of heart uh, or heavily invested in a particular theory. Uh, and we're all sort of invested in the particular theory. So, um, the, and the, um, I mean, what the human natural thing to do here is, you know, you, you get some data, but you know, you've got your pet theory, and if it doesn't work, you ignore it. If it, um, uh, you know, you make up a story. I tell you a story. One of the most famous neuropsychologists in the world, maybe the most famous neuropsychologist in the world. Uh, I spent a year with him in London uh, 20 years ago, and I showed him two pieces of data. And uh, he was interested in the work I was doing on, uh, on problem solving. One piece of data was consistent with this theory. It was great, right? It needed to be published right away. The other was inconsistent. But he said, well, it's a pet study, it's this, who knows what the patients were doing. You know, this isn't, this isn't human nature, right? We're all like this. Um, and, but uh, to the young people here, to the students, uh, the, I mean, this, really I'm, I'm speaking to you here, is uh, uh, as you start in your career, look at the whole elephant, walk around the elephant. Different bits of data are going to give you different snapshots of it. For most of us, we're too old and too fixed in our ways to ever change. Uh, but uh, um, you guys uh, uh, can have a better shot at this. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of implications for cognitive theories of reasoning, um, so for thinking, I think the general picture is uh, uh, multiple systems dynamically reconfigured in response to task and environmental cues. The cognitive theories of reasoning need to acknowledge that differences in logical form and content lead the brain to recruit different neural systems or modules. If we accept that these uh, dissociations are telling us something about the causal joints in the system, we need to rework the theories. Uh, the com com components I've identified are sort of a formal pattern matcher or matchers, a content sensitive pattern matcher, a conflict detection system, and a system for maintaining uncertain information. And uh, the way I think about them is they provide mid-level systems or constructs for theory building. Okay, they're not at the computational level, but they're not at the phenomenological level. And what we're doing now is actually using these uh, systems and modules that we've identified. Um, and I've got, I was lucky enough to find a graduate student that could actually, uh, is a computer programmer, and we've been building computational models uh, using those systems and seeing what happens when you uh, delete one or you know, as you sort of uh, lesion them. That was sort of the data that I had there before. Okay. Okay. 
And also in terms of frontal lobe organization, because I mean logic, yes, I'm interested in logical reasoning, but I'm also interested in how the brain is organized. And so for me, it's been equally important uh, that, that what I've learned about the brain has, you know, from doing logical tasks. When I began, uh, I phoned up a famous neuropsychologist, asked him, what should I be looking for when I'm doing these logical reasoning tasks? And he said, Donald said, uh, frontal lobes. And I said, well, where's the data on it? Uh, there is no data, right? Um, I, I once submitted a paper uh, 10, 15 years ago. The reviewer sent it back. They must have made a mistake. There's no frontal lobe activation. How can it possibly be? You know? It was a reasoning task. So um, one of the things that we found by doing these reasoning tasks is that prefrontal cortex is selectively involved in human reasoning. So for example, it's much more involved in syllogisms than it's uh, involved in transitive inference. Secondly, left and right prefrontal cortex are differentially involved in cognitive processing. The left is critical for uh, reasoning about conceptually coherent, meaningful, familiar material. The right is preferentially involved in indeterminate reasoning. And the, left, uh, the right is also preferentially involved in reasoning about incoherent and uh, conflicting material. And finally, the last slide. So is there a logic module in the brain after all this? And as, as I said at the beginning, we certainly cannot find evidence for a logical module in the brain. And uh, the data that we've been generating says there is no logical module in the brain. Logical reasoning is underwritten by multiple distributed systems, dynamically engaged by structural and environmental cues. And I'm sure there is some duplication and redundancy built into these systems. Right? I think, and this is an assumption or intuition, is that the basic logical notions and relations are built into the system. Right? And uh, it may not be a unitary mechanism, that is example, that I gave is resolving linear relations may require different machinery than in resolving set inclusion relations. Also, reasoning is connected with both with linguistic and spatial abilities. I don't think there is uh, um, you know, much traction in arguing about uh, uh, spatial and linguistic because there's clearly evidence for both. Um, and again, personally, uh, I've come to the conclusion, uh, surprisingly and reluctantly, that Simple inferences, uh, especially those couched in familiar vocabulary, are built into the structure of the language system. Um, and this may even, you know, I've been doing a little bit of thinking about maybe is this the origin of logic and whatnot, but that's sort of a slightly different story. And more complex inferences, those, uh, and, you know, those are uh, void of familiar vocabulary or just involving multiple steps require uh, an appeal to the visual spatial system. Then you actually have to uh, sort of build up the system uh, involving working memory, executive functions, and uh, so forth. But our basic notions and intuitions about uh, you know, contradiction, about um, you know, conjunction, implication, so forth, I, I, I think they really are uh, uh, built into the structure of language. And I think that's the last slide. Yes. Thank you.